It's not just this week's fifth anniversary of Japan's Fukushima nuclear disaster. Here in France, the viability of nuclear power put to the test by news on two fronts. The week began with the shock resignation of the chief financial officer of French power giant EDF, Thomas Picmal, raising red flags over the 16 billion euros EDF would have to front for the construction of the next generation nuclear reactor at Hinkley Point in southwestern England. Now, both the UK and French governments insist it's full speed ahead, but is it really? Could Hinkley Point really threaten to sink EDF, which is the world's biggest power company? We'll see how much hinges on the huge delays at other projects using the same EPR technology in places like France and Finland. Meanwhile, the clock ticking on yesterday's technology, you might say. In the past week, France has faced fresh calls to shut down aging nuclear plants near its borders with Switzerland, Germany, and Luxembourg. For decades, the French have enjoyed cheaper utility bills than all of their neighbors, thanks to their 58 nuclear reactors. Most of them were built to last 30 years, but the deadline for decommissioning keeps getting pushed back further and further. How safe are those plants? What's the alternative? Today in the France 24 debate, is nuclear power a ticking time bomb? And with us, uh, Raiko Hasewaga of the DeVast project. Uh, what is, uh, hold on, I wrote it down here. Uh, disaster evacuation and risk perception in democracies. Right. Many thanks for being with us. Thank you. Thanks as well to Bruno Combi, who chairs environmentalists for nuclear energy. Uh, thank you for joining us. And uh, from London, Tom Burke, uh, the chair of E3G. Explain to us what E3G is. It uh, stands for third generation environmentalism, and it's really the sort of most modern edge of the environmental community as we move from campaigners and conservationists into the people who really are the professionals uh, working to improve the way in which we look after the environment. All right, and uh, we're going to jump right into it. The False Van Get Debate on Facebook and Twitter, hashtag F24 Debate. Let's begin with Fukushima. Next Friday marks the fifth anniversary of the tsunami that swept over the ocean barrier, knocking out po the power to vital cooling systems at that nuclear plant. Now, today, authorities still working to fully decommission the plant, which is uh, run by Japanese company TEPCO. They hope to have that done by the end of 2017. Their biggest challenge, keeping contaminated water from seeping into the ocean while cooling the reactors. The site now filled with um, storage tanks for that contaminated water. The problem of the contaminated water doesn't end here. There's still so much left. The walls need to be built properly so that we can work towards containing the contaminated water from mounting even more. Raiko Hasewanga, when you think back five years, how would you say that the cleanup is going? Uh, today, uh, cleanup work, um, not only at the um, uh, accident at um, the um, nuclear power plant, but also cleanup work continues in the residential area surrounding the, the nuclear power station, which had an accident. And uh, it has been uh, going on, but at the same time, um, the government authorities, I mean, Japanese authorities, have uh, also troubles. Um, getting uh, agreement from the residents living around to stock uh, these um, uh, decontaminated soil. Uh, as a cleanup uh, work, basically they um, uh, took out uh, the contaminated uh, land, the soil, and tried to st stock it, uh, keep it um, in a plastic bag, and try to, at the moment, try to place to store these um, decontaminated. It sounds like Mission Impossible. Uh, uh, yes, it is a gigantic um, work, cleanup work, that is going on not only at the um, uh, Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant, but also in the whole residential area surroundings. And the um, also the area that was contaminated by this nuclear accident uh, uh, goes to 1,800 square kilometers. So this is a very vast area um, of, um, that, that they need to clean up. Yes. Now, uh, would you say, when you think back to that day, March the 11th, 2011, mm -hmm. would you say that this disaster has been 
worse than expected or has it been a little bit less than you thought it might could have been? Um, I would say the situation, because I, my research is focused on the consequence on the population and the social conse consequences from this nuclear disaster, I, I would say after five years, the situation has not been improved much. And I, I would say that the social disaster, th this nuclear disaster, has, um, has become a major social disaster in Fukushima. That's that I can... Uh, and what do you blame it on? Is again the 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 what's the original sin? Is it a wall, uh, a, an ocean barrier for tsunamis that wasn't high enough, or just simply the fact that you shouldn't build nuclear power plants in an earthquake-prone zone? Um, there is, of course, a discussion and debate about that uh, question. But I would say that um, the nuclear power plant, who, which had a grave accident like Fukushima Daiichi, um, but if you look at in the map, there is a Fukushima Daini number two nuclear power station that is situated 10 kilometers south of the number one station for the accident. And there is another nuclear uh, power plant uh, close to um, uh, in Onagawa nuclear power station that is uh, in the Miyagi prefecture that had even higher, had affected by a higher tsunami um, uh, than the one that was hit um, uh, the, the, the Fukushima, Daiichi. Fukushima Daiichi. Yeah. But those two other nuclear power plants didn't have a grave accident like Fukushima Daiichi, which means that there was a human error in this um, accident. It's not just because there was a tsunami, yes. Bruno Combi, of course, we're talking about um, a field, nuclear energy, where uh, you have to have zero mistakes. Yes, of course, nuclear energy has to be safe. But if you look at the records worldwide, it is a very safe source of energy, even when you include, of course, the terrible disaster at Fukushima. Still, you have to remember that no one has died from radiation in Fukushima. It might be a social disaster, that's true. But no one was died from radiation. Authorities so no are saying there's at least one case of leukemia that they can directly attribute, and there could be more. Well, it's one case of leukemia that was, for administrative reasons, directly attributed. It's not proven that medically it's attributed. It's not the same thing. If the person has a special status that he will receive an indemnity from the government because he's considered a victim, because he received a, more than a certain number of millisieverts, but the relationship of, cannot be established in a certain manner. And it's only one case when 20,000 persons died from the tsunami, so the big disaster was mostly the tsunami, and of course the social consequences of the evacuation. But the, we should also remember that this was an early type of nuclear reactor, which had only a very thin containment, only 10 centimeters of steel. The reactors that are in operation today in France or in, in Western Europe, and that we are planning to build in the future, have at least one meter thick of reinforced concrete. That's very big. And the EPR reactor, which we're talking about for Hinkley Point, is two times more than one meter thick of reinforced concrete with a double containment. Now, if that reactor had been at Fukushima, even with the bad estimation of how high the wave and the tsunami would be, nothing would have happened and the reactor would be entirely safe. So we're talking about, of course, not a zero risk. Zero never exists, but we have to make it as safe as possible. And the safest reactor on Earth is certainly the EPR reactor, which is planned for Hinkley Point. I'd like to come back to the number of deaths that uh, the, that Mr. mentioned. Um, actually, there has been uh, about 2,000 deaths indirectly related to the accident that was recognized by the government. And this 2,000 deaths is among a total of 120, uh, no, sorry, 160,000 evacuees. Um, it's caused. hard to quantify it, isn't it? Because some yes. of those deaths are uh, people suffering heart attacks under stress, this kind of thing. Yes, exactly. These, mm. these of course, deaths were caused. That's why it's called indirect death. But it was recognized by the authorities. But this number, when it comes to the evacuees from tsunami, it's 1,400. It's less than although the total number of evacuees caused by tsunami is bigger, larger than the evacuee, number of evacuees caused by the accident. So, of course, there is some difference there that basically the nuclear accident causes more stress, more death, indirect death, to 
uh, the evacuees, the population, than that tsunami as a natural disaster. I, I want to welcome at this point uh, Renaud Abor de Châtillon. Thank you for being with us, former advisor to uh, the French uh, industry and environment ministries uh, uh, here in France. Uh, I, I want to bring in Tom Burke at this point. Uh, Tom, do you agree with Bruno Combi that uh, we shouldn't blow things out of proportion when it comes to safety in nuclear power? Uh, I think that you really want to consider much more than just the body count of deaths when you look to evaluate a complicated problem like this. This, has already been said, has been a social catastrophe. The people who used to live near Fukushima are not really ever going to go back. They've had their lives completely disrupted and destroyed. And the economic catastrophe is enormous. It's cost the Japanese economy at least a hundred billion dollars already, and we're still counting. This accident isn't over yet. So I think the focusing on just how many people get killed by radiation is so something of a distraction from an evaluation of uh, just how serious this accident was, uh, in a sense. The record of the nuclear industry in the Western countries, France included, on safety has been very good. Uh, it has led to as what is required, pretty much false-free, fault-free uh, management. But you'd have to wonder a lot about whether that can be sustained uh, as you go around the rest of the world, in particular when you look at China and the rate at which the Chinese are building reactors. And what we learned from Fukushima is a disaster, nuclear disaster anywhere, is a disaster everywhere and has an enormous effect on public opinion. So you're putting an awful lot of uh, confidence in everybody else's regulators when you become reliant on nuclear power for your energy. Uh, Renaud, à bord de Châtillon, let me bring you in at this point. Uh, the, the next generation power plants that are being uh, built in places like China, should we uh, have some doubts, some questions? Uh, I think the new generation, the EPR, as, you, as we call it, uh, is designed to have more safety. Uh, Even in places like China? I hope so. <laughs> of course. Uh, first, you have safety. The, the idea of the EPR is that it's a car when you have uh, ice on the road, uh, you have uh, the car is going straight, uh, not with human uh, deficiencies. It's, uh, but it's costly. But I hope uh, it will work, but it is the new design of this thing. Second, we have in France the Autorité de Sûreté, which is independent. I hope which China will, will, will have s such standards uh, in order to, not to the government to say, uh, go on, go on, or uh, stop. As I said earlier, just I want to come to the safety of the EPA. I mean, this is not about technology, as I said. There were three nuclear stations hit by the tsunami, the same tsunami in Japan, but there's only one uh, nuclear station who had a grave accident. It's because it's not because of the natural disaster, the tsunami, which caused the accident. It was a human error. And this human error happens, of course, in every country, and especially when you're talking about China, when we, we have to talk about a lot of transparency there, what kind of laws in place to really check, uh, regulate this energy. So this is not just about the technology um, of the nuclear re reactors, but how the people are trained, how there's a transparency of information to guarantee that safety. That, that is, is the most important point. Bruno Combi? Yes, at this point, I think we have to enlarge the picture a little bit and see that the UK today has a big energy problem. In the past, the UK was gifted with uh, natural energy, lots of coal, lots of oil, lots of gas, which is not the case in France, for example. That's the reason we started our nuclear program and made it as clean as possible. But in the future, the UK is going to be like France. The oil and gas production has been declining very strongly by a factor two and a factor four in just the last 10 years and in the future is going to decline even more. And so they need to replace these massive amounts of energy produced by oil, gas, and coal by something else. In just a few years, the UK has already become the seventh and ninth importer in the world of gas, oil, and coal. And you're saying nuclear energy is the only game in town? 
Well, uh, it's the only way to produce massive amounts of energy at an affordable cost and in a clean manner that's carbon free. We have no other solution. It's a clean solution. It works when it's built properly and operated properly, which I feel is the case for the EDF reactors. And of course, EDF can perfectly do that in a proper manner. All right, Tom Burke, uh, because again, people talk about renewables, but uh, uh, if you want to produce energy on a large scale, that argument is put forth, the one that you heard from Bruno Combi. It's nuclear is the only option. It's certainly an argument that's put forth, and you'd have a bit more confidence if there was an EPR reactor uh, working anywhere in the world, but there isn't yet. So we don't know whether it's actually going to perform as expected. But really, the idea that it's cheap is simply wrong. The uh, price for getting uh, a reactor at Hinkley from EDF is we have to pay about three times more uh, than we currently pay for our electricity, and we have to do it for 35 years. Now, the uh, price of electricity is going down as we put more renewables on the system, and even more importantly, as we improve our energy efficiency, demand for electricity is falling in the UK. So we have much cheaper options to meet our electricity demand going forward than building an expensive nuclear power station. We can use energy efficiency. There are the renewables available for us uh, to do that. We can manage the generating capacity we have, which is already twice what we need when we have peak electricity demand. So we have a lot of options, all of which are cheaper and quicker and more reliable than Hinkley Point will be. We're going to pick up on those points with our panel. When we come back, you're watching the France 24 debate.